on chapter 3. Perhaps the most familiar portion of God's Word. John chapter 3. And after that, quietly, thank you God for sending Jesus. John 3. Right? Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born anew, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born anew. The wind blows where it wills, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know whence it comes or whither it goes, so it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can this be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand this? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whosoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God sent the Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does what is true comes to the light, that it may be clearly seen that his deeds have been wrought in God. After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the land of Judea, there he remained with them and baptized. John also was baptizing at Enon near Salem because there was much water there. And people came here, came and were baptized for John had not yet been put in prison. Now a discussion arose between John's disciples and a Jew over purifying. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan to whom you bore witness, here he is baptizing and all are going to him. John answered, No one can receive anything except what is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear we witness that I said I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, the friend of the bridegroom, who stands and hears him, rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now full, he must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth, and of the earth he speaks. He who comes from heaven is above all. He bears witness to what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. He who receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for it is not by measure that he gives the Spirit. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has eternal life. 
He who does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God rests on him. This is the word of the Lord. Quiet to them, let us sing in prayer. Thank you, God, for sending Jesus. Thank you, God, for sending Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that you came. Holy Spirit, won't you teach me more about his lovely name? Once again, thank you, God, for sending Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that you came. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much. Have you got your outline there? And by the way, in case I forget, do keep this over the Christmas period with your notes, won't you? I don't want to have to ask the office to do any more for me. So keep the one you have and bring it back with you at the beginning of next term. John chapter 3 is the subject of our lecture this evening. And uh, if you notice on the <coughs> outline of it, we've seen um, the life announced in John chapter 1 verse <coughs> 19 to chapter 2 verse 22 and the life acknowledged in chapter 2 and verse 23 to chapter 4 verse 54. Now up here. Just one moment. I'm the one who's not clear. <coughs> we'll be clear in one moment. Hold it a minute, please. Now, if you look at that outline again, I'm sorry, moment's confusion. We've seen the life announced by the witness of John the Baptist in chapter 1, verse 19 to 36, and the witness of the first disciples in chapter 1, verse 37 to 51, and uh, the witness of the works. Now, um, that was the miracle of Cana, the wedding, the marriage feast, and the cleansing of the temple. If you look down your notes a moment, the um, outline, you'll see, we're going to see later, in chapter 5 through chapter 12, the life antagonized. But um, between these, we are studying the life acknowledged in chapter 3 and 4. And our subject tonight is chapter 3. And the life is acknowledged in these, these two chapters, first by three different types of people. First by a Pharisee, A member of the Sanhedrin. You see that in chapter 3, 
verse 1 through 21. And then it's acknowledged in chapter 4, verses 1 through 42, by a woman of Samaria. And in chapter 4, verses 43 to 54, it's acknowledged by a nobleman, one of Herod's people. Here then is the life of Jesus acknowledged by those three different types of people. A Pharisee, chapter 3, a Samaritan woman, chapter 4, and a nobleman at the end of chapter 4. Just notice that these are found, all of them, in different parts of Palestine. Judea, that's the south, Samaria, and central, and the nobleman in Galilee at the north. In all these different parts of the country, the life is acknowledged. And it's very interesting to watch, as we shall do, the ways of approach Jesus made to people. Never approach two people in the same way. One of them, Nicodemus, to his mind. The other, the woman of Samaria, to her conscience. And this nobleman to his heart. So Jesus, his initial approach to each one of these three people was different. We'll see that as we go through. Quite a man, Nicodemus. All of his history is in John's Gospel. All we know about him. I'll give it to you in three parts. Three points for a sermon for you. <laughs> Ready for it? First of all, chapter 3, verses 1 through 21, his desire for Jesus. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 21, his desire for Christ. And chapter 7, verse 45 to 52, his defense of Christ. Chapter 7, verse 45 to 52. Does our law accuse anybody? Unless we have all witnesses, she said. Chapter 7, verse 45, 52. And chapter 19, verse 38 through 42. His devotion to Christ. Chapter 19, verse 38 to 42. It was he who took ointment to embalm his body and he too, who took him with Joseph of Arimathea in that body to the tomb. So I repeat so that you've got it clear. Verses three, chapter 3, verses 1 through 21, Nicodemus' desire for Jesus. 45 to 52, a verse of chapter 7, his defense of Jesus. In chapter 19, verse 38 to 42, his devotion to Jesus. Now, of course, this story here tells us the absolute necessity of regeneration. The necessity of regeneration. Nicodemus was a ruler, but he needed a redeemer. He thought well of Christ, verse 2. This man came to Jesus by night. I suppose he came by night because he wouldn't compromise his position. Nobody would know. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, 
that is as distinct from coming from one of our seminaries or colleges. We know you're a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Yes, he thought well of Jesus, but not well enough. Verses 12 through 13. If I have told you, said Jesus to him, earthly things, and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? You think well enough of Christ. Every society has its terms of membership. Christ laid down his. Verse 3, you must be born again his terms of membership just to uh, give you the Greek word there would you like to put it down I'll spell it out to you A-N O T-H-E-N Anothen and the word means from above you must be born from above A-N-O-T-H-E-N there's no other way eternal life that's the hallmark of everybody in the kingdom that means not evolution but revolution not evolution but Revolution. You can't evolve from the flesh to the spirit. Verse 6. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. The word for spirit, by the way, is the word pneuma. P-N-E-U-M-A. It's the word from which we get in English pneumatic. Numa. The same word is used for wind. Of both words here. You can't evolve from the flesh to the spirit. It's dear old Dr. Tilso. You know him, do you? Got his books? You should get every book in the bookshop by Tilso. Tremendous. What? Uh, that's the problem isn't it taking them around yes, well. <laughs> I suppose I couldn't take them all but uh, he's a great friend of mine years ago in Chicago it's he who said um, if you can account for a Christian on the basis of psychology you've unfrocked him you've unfrocked him if you can account or try to explain a Christian on the basis of psychology you've unfrocked him you've got a church member on your hands but not a Christian not once tucking in here and putting right down here thinking about it's not evolution but revolution and if you want to know how well verses 5 and 8 Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. I said, the wind or the Spirit blows where it wills, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know whence it comes or whither it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. You notice, by the way, that both Nicodemus and Jesus asked how? Verse 4 Nicodemus said to him how can a man be born when he's old? Verse 9 Nicodemus said how can this be? And Jesus in verse 12 if I have told you earthly things you do not believe how can you believe if I have told you heavenly things? Bring those three hows round how? Jesus made it clear that a man must be born of water and of the Spirit. 
verse 5, hold it a moment. That does not mean water baptism. It does not mean water baptism. How do you make that out, you say? Well, I'll tell you. Undoubtedly, Nicodemus had been among that crowd who had heard John the Baptist preaching. Who said, Matthew 3, verse 11, Matthew 3, verse 11, I baptize you with water for repentance. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Get this down. Slow dictation speed. Ready? Down with it. John's baptism was for repentance with a view to forgiveness. Jesus' baptism was with the Spirit, capital S, as an evidence of repentance. I'll repeat that. John's baptism was with the with the, uh, with a view to forgiveness with water. John's baptism was for repentance with a view to forgiveness. Jesus' baptism was with the Spirit as an evidence of repentance. Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot see the kingdom of God. No, except a man repent and be born of the Spirit. He cannot see the kingdom. That's what Jesus is saying to him. And for the experience of the new birth, Jesus uses a simple and familiar Old Testament illustration in verse 14. You'll find it in Numbers 21. Numbers 21, verses 8 and 9. Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. You can go into that story, it's very familiar. And as everyone looked, they were healed. Nicodemus understood that three years later. He understood it at Calvary. just notice two musts here in verse 7 do not marvel that I said to you you must be born anew and verse 14 as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness so must the son of man be lifted up a must on our part because those are must on Jesus' part. And notice the New Testament test of a new birth in verse 19. This is a judgment that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. The New Testament test. Light has come, but men prefer darkness. That's it. Because their deeds are evil. And three words here notice also 
so often we've seen them and we will right through this gospel because of the key to the outline just notice them verse 15 whosoever believes in him shall have eternal life life that's one word verse 16 God so loved that's another word love the third word verse 19 this is the judgment that the light has come into the world the outline of the gospel the whole picture of it of what it tells, says about Jesus life love light nobody can explain a new birth it's an absolute mystery if you can't explain it but everybody here is a witness to it you can't explain it but we're all a witness to it But that here's a little quote from that great preacher C.H. Spurgeon ready for it here it comes here it comes ready what is the worth of the grace What is the worth of the grace which I profess to have received if it leaves me exactly the same kind of person that I was before I received it a faith which does not drastically alter my behavior of faith repeating which does not drastically alter my behavior will never change my destiny <coughs> will never change my destiny you got that oh. where from the beginning what worth is the grace repeating which I profess to have received which leaves me exactly the same kind of person that I was before I received it faith which does not drastically change my behavior will never change my destiny that's very unpopular preaching but I tell you it's the preaching that's needed today now come on with me a little further I'm not sure about this so I'm not uh, saying this is authoritative but there's every reason to believe that the conversation between Nicodemus and Jesus stopped at the end of verse 15 and that verses 16 through 21 are the reflections of John who wrote the gospel I mean I'm glad that a number of other think the same about 50-50 actually and personally I take that view because um, the expression only begotten son is never used by Jesus himself 
and verse 18 believe on the name whoever does what is true verse 21 suggest all point to this as being a reflection of what John was saying have you ever noticed that uh, in the English translation so loved the world that he gave his only oh, son S that whoever believes in him should not he perish but have eternal eternal life here yeah. that's purely interesting <laughs> no use to tell anybody that in any other country or with any other language <laughs> It's awful to speak by interpretation. Tell. I was in Brazil once and I said, uh, you know what faith is? F-A-I-T-H. Forsaking all, I take him. And my translator held up his hands in absolute despair. <laughs> Can't do a thing about that. So watch it when you try to translate into some other language. But that though just as a matter of interest now come on why did God send Jesus verse 17 this is why not to condemn but those who do not believe on his name that is do not put confidence in him are condemned already verse 18 Justification is conditioned by faith. Notice also here what terrific contrasts John has in this gospel. I'll give you them, some of them. Verse 16, the contrast of death and life. Verse 18, of belief and unbelief. Verse 19, love and hate. 19 and 20. Verse 20 and 21, doing evil and doing what's true. Tremendous contrast. Death and life, belief and unbelief, light and darkness, love and hate, doing and evil and doing what's true. Do you know what that says to me? It says this, I can't be neutral about Jesus. You want to take sides. I can't be neutral. Everyone must be either for him or against him. There are only two ways and two destinies. I want to be sure we're heading to the right goal. And you know what? If anyone can remain neutral about Jesus in your presence or mine, there's something wrong with our witness. I'll say that again. Anybody can remember can remain neutral in your presence or mine, neutral about Christ, there's something wrong with our testimony. A testimony should be such as it forces people to take sides. Not because of unpleasantness, but of something about us that makes a difference. Because that? Oh, me go down. Reverse gear. Start again. Can't remember what I said now. Oh, yes. If anyone can afford to be neutral about Jesus in your presence, there's something wrong with your witness. When I came to Christ, I was 21 years of age. Oh, that's a long time ago. I was training in Newcastle to be a chartered accountant. You call that in America or Canada, CPA. 
There were 60 of us in the office. One of them was a bit peculiar, I thought. All of us thought. The trouble about him was he was so consistent. Always got there on time. Never stopped early. Never had a break for a coffee or something stronger. Never took more than half an hour for lunch. Never stopped in the afternoon and always went on till about six and the office closed at five. And we told smutty stories, we had to shut up when he came. Not that he told us to, but we knew that it was sort of out of place in his company. And that man just made us hopping mad. Hopping mad. I knew now, I didn't know then, he's a Christian. I knew he was different. And uh, we couldn't be neutral. One day my boss said to me, I want you to go on an audit to somebody's books. An account of firm's books near Carlisle. And you'll be there for three weeks. There's no means of getting back and forward. It's a pain factory, miles up in the country. And you're going to go with, um, and he named this fellow. Three weeks in the company of a fellow who's a religious maniac. Two days before I went, I got half a dozen fellows around me, and over a glass of beer, I vowed that I'd knock the religion out of him in a week. So they wished me well. When we got there, only one bedroom in this pub. It's called the Grey Bull. Never seen a Grey Bull, but that's what it's called. And at eleven o'clock at night, he knelt down to pray. I've never seen anybody do that before, except in the church man again. And I thought to myself, what do I do now? Well, I thought the only thing to do is put up a good show and try. So I knelt down to pray. At least I knelt down with him. I watched him. Do you know how long he stayed down? Fifty-two minutes. Fifty-two minutes on a hard floor? No carpets? <laughs> I watched him through my fingers. I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to get up before him and fifty-two minutes he got up. And I stayed down an extra minute just to impress him. <laughs> then he got to bed. And I thought to myself as I went to bed, I put up a pretty good show tonight. And you know, I heard somebody walking across the floor. I'm sitting down on my bed and he said, um, excuse me, but do you ever think about anything seriously? I always used to whip up the fun. I said, uh, what do you mean? I said, do you, he said, do you want to be saved? That's the diplomatic approach. <laughs> You'll find it in a book on easy lessons and soul winning. And I just fired every gun at that fellow that I had. Let him have it. Made all the excuses, you know what. Then he said to me, do you know anything about victory over sin? I said, no. And for the first time in my life, he told me about Jesus. About his virgin birth and sinless life the atoning death, resurrection, ascension, and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And in 20 minutes he led me to know Jesus. You couldn't be neutral. You couldn't be neutral. I just tell you that because um, that's the miracle of the new birth. And uh, before somebody is born again, they've always met somebody else whose life needs an explanation. Shall I say 999 times out of a thousand? They've met somebody whose life can only be explained by miracle. Before I leave this passage, would you please jot down one little sentence among each verse Verse 16 to 21. Verse 16. God loved the world, but the benefits are for all who believe. His sun shines on us. 
but those who stay inside don't get the rays. Let me give you that again. God loved the world, but the benefits are for whoever believes. His sun shines on us, but those who stay indoors don't get the rays. R-A-Y-S Okay Verse 17 God saves men through Jesus Who condemns them? If a man dies of thirst on the edge of a reservoir R-E-S E-R V-O-I-R you know what that is? A place that contains water who's to blame? repeating God saves men through Christ who condemns them? if a man dies standing on the edge of a reservoir he dies of thirst who's to blame? Verse 18 It isn't difficult to escape judgment on sin Believing in Christ is possible to all who know him but it may be costly now here's just a little play on words get this down unless you won't see it to believe that is write it this way B-E hyphen L-I-E V-E to be leave means to leave L-E-A-V-E or in order to be a disciple just to play on words but notice it it be costly because to believe B-E dash L-I-E-V-E to believe means to leave L-E-A-V-E or in order to be B-E a disciple Got it? Verse 19 and 20 against these verses would you just write down this we make excuses for not believing in Christ but there's only one basic reason we make excuses for not believing in Jesus but there's only one basic reason loving the dark rather than the light okay and I've just written down at the bottom of these in my Bible you might like to write down the same Lord save me from making excuses to cover up sin Lord, save me from making excuses. Cover up sin. Now, in the last three minutes, just let me touch on the concluding portion of the chapter. 
verses 22 to 30, here's the last we hear of John the Baptist. What a lovely fellow he was. He's the most neglected prophet in the New Testament. I am longing to meet him. You notice he closes his ministry exactly as he started. He closes his ministry exactly as he started. He was loyal to Christ to the very end. Verse 28, you yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The disciples of John and Jesus were both baptizing. Verse 22 and 23. Jesus and his disciples went into the land of Judea. There he remained with them and baptized. John was also baptizing. Now, at just time, I won't go any further, but to point out to you there what looks like a contradiction. Just notice it in your in your Bible. Chapter four, verse two. John Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples. And yet, verses twenty two and twenty three. Jesus and the disciples went into the land. There he remained with them and baptized. There seems to be a contradiction. Again, without authority, but with conviction, I believe the answer is that Jesus did not baptize with water. But, but, his presence get this his presence gave the baptism of his disciples an authority from above people would have been very reluctant to accept their baptism. That's my conviction. You think it through as well it makes sense. All I want you to notice at the moment is that this led to a controversy with the Jews. Verse 25 and 26. Christians are pretty good at starting that also. John's disciples are jealous of Jesus' success. Verse 26. They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who is with you beyond Jordan, to whom you will bear witness, here he is baptizing, and all are going to him. Notice that John soon silenced them shut them up verse 29 he said in effect I am not a rival I'm a friend not a rival and a friend and he confirms his first testimony he says his job is to bring the bride and bridegroom together verse 29 that done his ministry was over He must increase, but I must decrease. I've called that the blessing of non-success. The blessing of non-success. I wonder if anybody could finish life more nobly than John did. Like the morning star. You noticed it recently? Terrific. 
these last few mornings it's eclipsed by the rising sun so John was eclipsed by Jesus and he wanted it that way tremendous way to finish your manuscript time 7.28 sorry bye God bless you